back. Adam and them done a great job. Adam and Jamie both appreciate you guys and your heart and sharing. And, and, uh, but it's good to be home and good to share God's word. Amen. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, this month. Um, this month is a very special month uh, for our church. Uh, you know, our heritage is very important, you know, and our foundations are very important, and we cannot forget those things. And February is always a time of remembrance for us in this church, um, of um, um, the time that, that uh, uh, Pastor Jim and Kathy and, and all the crew, and uh, several of you guys are, have, was there, but uh, uh, decided to build this building and uh, at a soup dinner, so... We always commemorate this time of year with a, with a soup dinner and the third week of February. So you guys get signed up for that. And, and, uh, but I really want to take this month and just talk to you about a message I've entitled Strong Church. Uh, a strong church. And we want to have a strong church. We do. We want to have a strong church. And, and I want to spend the next four weeks just talking about different facets of church culture and <clears throat> the DNA of the church. And I looked up the word strong just in the dictionary. <clears throat> and this is the, the words, this is how it define it. Having marked power, having great resources, having a large number, superior in its kind, <clears throat> effective or efficient, not weak, moving in power, well established, zealous, not easily disturbed or subdued. I like that. I mean, really, if you start taking that, start taking that and thinking about the church, that's what we want to be. We want to have marked power, right? We, we, we want to have a church that has power, that has resources, that is superior in its kind, not because we're trying to be better than anybody else, but we want to be excellent in everything that we do, and we want to be superior in things. We want to be effective and efficient. We don't want to be weak. We want to be moving in power. We want to be zealous. We want to be not easily disturbed or subdued as a people. Amen? So, so how do we define a strong church? And that's what we're kind of talking about. We're going to talk about the next few weeks here together. So maybe you're new here to this church. We want to say welcome. But for, for most in this sanctuary, this is your church. You've been a part of this church. And I want us to re, be re, refired again for the desire concerning church. It's really important what we do here. It's very important to your life. Now, I understand that church is not about a building. You know, this building could burn down, and Wednesday night we'll still be the church. Because the church is not about a building. However, we do gather in this building. But church is about all of us here. Right? It's about all of us. And what if, let me just ask some questions this morning. What if we really believe that the assembling together would truly be transformational in our lives? What, what if we would really believe that the people that God has connected us to in a church family could actually produce a strength and encourage us to finish our Christian walk strong? What if we would believe that? What if we believe that when we serve God using our gifts, our talents, <coughs> excuse me, in a church that it actually could cause eternal differences in people's lives and that God actually sees our sacrifice and will reward us for that sacrifice? What, what if we would truly see how our generosity in honoring God with our tithes, with our offerings, with giving for the work of the ministry is actually building something that's eternal <clears throat> and that's bigger than us? What if? What if we really believed it? Amen? So go with me this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter 28. <clears throat> We're going to use this passage of scriptures as a launching point for the whole four weeks but Genesis 28 let me give you a few just quotes um, this is a quote from me uh, the catalyst to community and cultural transformation is the local church this is what Bill Hybel said he, he's a pastor but he said nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry how his kingdom work in your community than your local church there's nothing like the local church when it's working right its beauty is indescribable, its power is breathtaking, its potential is unlimited. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. Hmm. This is what Paul Tripp said. He's another uh, traveling 
uh, minister, wrote several books, and uh, especially in counseling. He says, autonomous Christianity never works because our spiritual life was designed by God to be a community project. Think about that. The man who attempts Christianity without the church shoots himself in the foot, shoots his children in the leg, and his grandchildren in the heart. Kevin Dean. We should not allow, this is another one, this is the last one, we should not allow people to see the church as a weekly service they attend to make God happy. The gathering of the church is preparation for heavenly battle. We huddle together, it's Super Bowl Sunday, we huddle together for a few minutes each week to worship God together and build each other up so that each of us can be more effective, effectively to run the missional play throughout the week. J.D. Greer. You know, Faith Christian Fellowship exists for four reasons. To connect you to God and others. To grow you in your faith. Give you a place that you can serve God. And the fourth thing is you can go and be launched into this world and spread the gospel. When we break here every Sunday, when we break here every Wednesday and we leave this huddle, we go into the world to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen? But what goes on here, and I'm saying, and I'm using this as our local church, what goes on inside these doors, what goes on in this body, what goes on inside of our journey groups, or we together as people, wherever we're at, what goes on is very important to our faith. It's very important to our life. It's a very important part of our discipleship. People that are not involved in the church are lacking in that. You will not be able to totally be able to reach the thing that God has called you to without the local church. I didn't say it will save you. I didn't say you won't go to heaven. I said you won't be able to reach your full potential without it. Now you can amen or own me if that's the truth. Because the, cause the listen, the, 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 Jesus wants, he's called us to be a part of a body, a people. You're called here to this church. Amen. Well, you heard the call, whether you got invited. I've had people tell me the first time I walked in the door, I knew this was my church. I've had people tell me, you know what, I came here, I warmed up to it. Didn't know all about you crazy folks, but you know what? I come in, I warmed up to it, and I found, found this affinity, and I found this connection. I found it here. I truly believe when you find your family, you find your destiny. Many people are looking for destiny, but your destiny is found in your people. So once you find your people, you'll find your destiny. Amen. It's important. I love talking about the church. I'm going to have a good time. I love talking about the church. I'm a pastor, and I want you and I to fall in love again with the local church and what goes on inside of these walls. It's a beautiful thing. In Genesis chapter 28, let's go there together. Let's start here in verse 11. This is about Jacob, and we're going to pull some things out. So it came, so he came to a certain place. <clears throat> He just came to this place, stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and it reached toward uh, and reached to heaven, and there, there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. And in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. There is none, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put it at his head and set it, up, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and, I, and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, and I am the Lord God shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, 
and all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. We find here the primal idea of the house of God. The primal idea of the house of God. We find this thing, we see it being developed throughout Scripture, but we find here the primal idea, the idea of a house, of a place that God would dwell. A place that God's presence is there. This is, if you look in verse, it says, in verse 17, it says, This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This place, the place where the presence of the Lord is. Notice it wasn't particularly about a building. It was about the presence of God. What identified this place as the house of God was the presence of God. So he said, I'm, this place is the house of God. Now we understand, if we take it and start looking at it, that we are the house of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. That you and I are houses that God lives in. Amen. The Bible says you're living stones being built up a spiritual house. So I understand that it's personal. But it was also about a place. It was also about a place. Because we see a Paul addressing Timothy, he says this, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God. Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15. He said, I want to show you how you need to be acting in God's house. So God's house is just not a personal thing, me being the house of God. The house of God can be a place, can be a place, a local church. A local church. So we see this idea. Of, of, of the house of God being identified. And what identified the house of God was a place where the presence of God was, was at. The presence of God was there. Amen. So if we're going to, listen, if we're going to build a great church, a great church is built on the foundation of the Lord Jesus. We know that, right? It's built on the, on the foundation, no other foundation than any man lay, but that which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. The foundation is Jesus Christ, the teachings of the apostles. The Bible says that. But if we're going to build a great church, it's going to take people, and it's going to take the presence of God. A great church just doesn't happen. A strong church just doesn't happen. It happens because of people and the presence of God. People in the presence of God. There's myths about church. Myths about what builds a great church. Many people believe that facilities will, will build, a, build a strong church or produce a strong church. That's not true. We like facilities. We have a beautiful facility. We want more facilities. But at the end of the day, that's not what builds a strong church. Many people think, well, location will build a strong church. Not necessarily. Money, man, if we had money, then we can build a strong church. Wrong. It's a byproduct of having a strong church. <coughs> Amen. Large numbers, that doesn't, have, doesn't mean you're going to have a strong church. It's a byproduct of having a strong church. Great outreaches, it, it, it's good. It's a byproduct of having a strong church. Amen. So it takes people to build a strong church. I'm laying foundation today. But I want you to understand that God builds the church. Jesus builds it. He's building the church. And he's going to build it with strong people. Amen. The dream. He said he had a dream. If you notice this dream he had, he said he began to dream about this. He said, listen, he said this, this house, this, the presence of God, the, he, he starts making promises to him about, about taking land. And I don't want to get into all this about super, it's a supernatural place, possessing lands, families are blessed. Read it. It's about the dream he had. So inside the local church, it, 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 this place should be identified with supernatural things. This place should be identified with possessing land. This place should be recognized as families being blessed. We are a family worship center for developing and equipping the saints for the work of their ministry that all may participate in leading people to Jesus, showing the way to the city of refuge. That's our mission statement. We're here to build a strong church. A strong church. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We'll read it on the screen together. When Jesus came in the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14, they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some and others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Verse 15, and he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Next verse. But Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
Woo! Glory to God. Look here. And I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Keep that right there. Who's building the church? Come on. Talk to me now. Who's building the church? Jesus is building the church. He said, I'm going to build the church. I'm going to build my church. And it's going to be on the revelation of who Jesus is. It's going to be a revelation of who Jesus is. The reason you're going to be able to build this church is because you're going to be able to hear from heaven. You're going to have people come and hear from God. I'm going to build my church with people that have ears to hear and know who Jesus is. He said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell, the influence of hell, will not prevail against this church. This is one of the most hope-filled scriptures in the Bible. Because I've often wondered, and I know we've all asked questions, what will happen to the church? We see stuff going on, churches collapsing, churches uh, folding. We see bodies, right? People, uh, church, church houses, people that, uh, that the, the doors are closed. And we got people that seems, we have a generation of, of people that seems to be walking away from the faith for very many reasons. But, but we, have, we have this going, we, we ask ourselves, we see, we, we see stuff going on in the world. We wonder what's going to happen to the church. Listen, I want you to know something tonight, today. Listen, Jesus is building the church and the church is going to be here because why? He's protecting it. He's sustaining stay in it and he's the one now if we're not hearing from heaven stuff's going to start happening amen that's my responsibility that's leadership responsibility making sure we're hearing from heaven and moving when the cloud moves and don't get stuck come on some people are afraid to move forward Amen. This is a strong church. A church where the influence of hell is not prevailing against it. Amen. Bill Hybel said it, so there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. There's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And this is what this is about. This series is about is getting things, making sure. We, we have a strong church here. I believe that. But the deal is, is that we've got to make sure we're stirring ourselves up and making sure we're, this thing is working right. I'm hoping to make you mad during this series. Amen. So Jesus building it. He's the one. It's his sole mission to build the church. We have saw through history empires falling. We saw multi-million dollar companies fold up. We thought that would never go out of business. Amen. What makes the church different? Jesus. He's the one building the church. Now, again, it's not, I want you to think, I want you to kind of think now, I'm not just strictly talking about this building, though in this series I'm talking about our church body. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you've got Methodist, Baptist, Pentecost, whatever you've got above your head, that, that listen, we're all, if, we, if we are in line with Jesus as Savior and Lord, then we're all part of the body of Christ. We're a part of the church. But I'm talking specifically about our church, and in, inside of that universal church is the local church. Amen. He said, I'm going to what? Build the church. Everybody say build. Stay with me. The word build... In the Greek, it means to take from a design into the process of growing or completion. He said, I've got a design. Jesus said, I'm going to, the word build in the Greek, it means to take from an architectural design to a completion. He said, I'm going to build this thing. I'm going to, get, we're going, I'm going to give my people the design. I'm going to give my people what it should look like. And I'm going to carry it out to the end. Jesus is building the church. It is what he's doing. He is building the church. He is building the church. He is building the church. The word church in the Greek is the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. And it means an entire assembly of individuals who are called out, called forth, and separated and who therefore hold a position of honor and privilege of being ambassadors of Christ. 
See, Jesus called you out. Stay with me now. When you got born again, Jesus called you out. You are the ecclesia. You are the church. He's called you out of the world into a place, into a body of people, into a place that you and I can now have the honor and privilege of being an ambassador for him in the world. That's what Jesus called you to. He's called you to the church. He's called you. Now, he's called you. It reminds me of this scripture in John chapter 15 where it says there that you and I are appointed to bear fruit. I think it's John 15. I don't know if I gave you that or not. John 15 verse 16. Go Find that for me real quick, Ashley. It'll be good. God has chosen you. You did not choose me, but I what? He said, I chose you, and what? Appointed. You see that? Everybody say appointed. I've appointed you. That you go, bear, go and bear fruit. The word appoint means to set or to put in place. It means to transplant, actually. He said, I've put you in the place. God called you out, and he's put you in a place that you could bear fruit. He has to put you somewhere. He has to plant you somewhere. As a people, God says, listen, he's called you out. And he's also, he said, listen, I'm going to put you somewhere. I'm going to plant you somewhere in order for you to bear fruit. In Psalm 92, look what it says up here on the screen. Psalm 92, look at this. Those who are planted in the what? In the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Planted in the house of the Lord. God takes you and plants you into the church. He plants you into the house of the Lord. Plants you there. Why? You can bear fruit. For those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the course of our God. For they, verse, okay, verse 14, for they shall bear fruit in what? In old age. And they shall be what? Fresh and flourishing. The King James says fat and flourishing. People that are planted in the house of the Lord, in the local church, in the body of Christ, it begins to cause growth in your life. Now Jesus is committing to building the church. I understand he's talking about the universal church. But listen, inside the universal, universal church is the local body. It's the local church. Everybody is in the artery, the main artery of the church. But off of those arteries are these veins, are called the local church. And you and I are called by God, appointed by God, to be a part of a local assembly. If you go right there back in your scripture in Genesis 28, look what happens in verse 11. You guys hot? Good? What are you? Good? All right, good. Verse 11, he says this. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the what? He took one of the stones and what happened? He laid his head on the what? Stay with me. Stones. The Bible says you're living stones. Building a spiritual house. Jacob is a type of the Holy Spirit building the church. And Jacob lays his head upon the stone. See, what happens is God gives you a dream. He lays his head on you and begins to download to you his ideas, his dreams, what he wants. So what happens is now, listen to me now, God says, listen, I'm going to appoint you I'm going to appoint you. I'm going to set you into a church. You're going to become a stone in that church. And you're going to pick up on the dream of that church. And you're going to start building that church right where you're at. That's good stuff. He needs stones. Stones make no sense without another stone. Bricks make no sense without another brick. 
So it's when you come, God builds his church with people. You bring resources. In order for God to build something, he has to have, a res- he has to have resources. And guess what? You're here because you got some resources. Come on now. You may be sitting on your resources, but get off your resources and start using your resources. <laughs> Amen. He chooses you. Man. So we have this universal church. All of those that are born again. People don't go to church. There's people that don't go to church, they're saved. They're part of the universal church. The universal church. Amen. I mean, the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was one of the earliest uh, apostolic creeds that they had. And they stated the things they believed. We believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ, His only Son, born of a virgin. But one of the things in there is I believe, versus we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Well, the word Catholic is the word universal. We believe in the universal church. We believe that when people get in saved, they get placed inside of a body. God calls them out and placed into this peculiar people. You know you're peculiar? Let me ask you guys a question. Who in the world sits around on a daily basis and reads ancient documents? Have you ever thought about it? Uh, who, who does that? Right? You call it your Bible, but it's ancient documents. You realize that, right? Wrote right over 1,500 years, span of 1,500 years, 40-some different authors. Uh, you're really strange. You sit around and read letters wrote to a church that was uh, at uh, whatever, 50, 65 uh, A.D. You're peculiar. You're strange. But we are a strange bunch. That's the way God's called us. So everybody is a part of this, and, and, and you get brought in to the family of God. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 that says over there that, that for this cause I bow my name to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You get brought into the family. Amen. So when you get born again, you get placed into the body of Christ, the church. God brings you into union with himself and also with one another. That's what's so interesting. What's so interesting, church, is this. is my union is not only with Jesus, my union is with you. Do you know the spiritual ties are much stronger than natural ties? Do you realize that I'm connected to you? This would do us, behoove us to understand that because, listen, you, you would, you, we wouldn't talk about people if we really believed they were a part of us. You wouldn't do that. You're not only united with Christ, but you're united with this body. Woo! This is powerful. I, I get excited about this because this is who we are. And we start understanding the purpose of the church and why it's a part of why we're doing what we're doing. It's amazing. First Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look on the screen real quick. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, member, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Talk about the body of Christ whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. We're united. Next next scripture. Next one. I think it's uh, verse, what, 27 or something? Now you are the body of Christ and what? The apostle Paul pulls upon the analogy of the body, uh, the body of Christ being like a human body. He said, you're one body, but you've got many members. You've got, you're one person. Like I said, Jesus is the head of this thing, and we are the body of Christ. We're carrying on his mission. We're carrying on his vocation. We're carrying on what he came to establish. That's why when you come in the door, I've said this many times, we'll say it again. 
It, it wasn't like when you come in the door, here comes Rob with his head. No, here comes Rob. She is the head, we're the body. And we're one. And we're united to one another. When you get born again, you're placed into the body of Christ. The universal church. However, inside of the universal church is the local church. I want you to think about the local church as like embassies for Christ. We're all ambassadors in the universal church. But across this world, there are, uh, there are embassies that you are drawn to to be a part of. It's called the local church. It's the microcosm of the universal church. The local church is the harvest of the universal church. The local church is the harvest of the universal church. And just as the body has many members, the body of Christ, uh, just as the body has many members, the body of Christ has members. And the local church has different churches or local bodies. So when a person becomes a Christian, he doesn't just join the local church because it's a good habit. It's you join the local church because it's essential to your discipleship. I want you to know something. Again, this is a local assembly. And there's local assemblies all across this area that's meeting today. Nobody's better than anybody else. We all have our different embassies. Nothing wrong with that. Just like there's a KFC... And a Taco Bell, right? Or a Chinese or whatever. There's something for everybody. Let me ask you guys a question. How would you define our church? What, if you could draw, on, an, draw on, a, on a restaurant, what would you say it is? Hey, the steakhouse. I want you to understand something, that God draws you and places you not only into the universal church, but He places you into a local assembly. I know this is old hat for all of us. Maybe you've heard this teaching, but I want you to understand you're not here by happenstance. You're here because God has placed you. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord, those that are put in place, I have chosen you and I have placed you to bear fruit. And he places you within a local assembly in order to grow, in order to, bene- to build this church into a place that it begins to make a global impact. This is not the end all. It's our huddle. It's our huddle. Listen to this. Uh, John Wesley said this, The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. So the idea of of people living their lives independently of the local church was foreign concept to the early church. If you remember now, they had had local assemblies. Apostle Paul wrote to churches. He told them to go establish churches. He would ordain bishops and he would ordain pastors and leaders of certain churches. He wrote letters to certain churches in certain regions. He wrote to people that were housing churches in their home. It's important that you find your people. Amen. God builds the church with people. And you're drawn to this place for a reason. Amen. So God calls you to a local church. Now, this is the deal. You don't choose your local church. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think it's in verse, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as what? Just as he pleased. Not as you please. God places you. God is the one that draws you. God is the one. God's the one that selects your church, not you. Many people choose their churches for many different reasons. But it's God that chooses the church for you. Come on, somebody. Are you guys alive? Come on. This is the truth. You don't play, you, God, God is the one that places you in the body. That's his pleased, pleased him, not you. And guess what? You don't choose your family. Amen. Now, some of you like to be able to choose your family, but you can't choose your family. Right? You're born into it. We're born into the body of Christ, right? 
And then all of a sudden, God directs us into a local church. And in that local church, there's all kinds of personalities. You know that uncle? You know the uncle that you don't... (laughs) Right? But she's still family. I remember my mommy telling me that. Uh, you know, my dad, you know, most of the story known about my, my, my dad. My dad was, you know, he just struggled with alcoholism. And, you know, I remember my mom saying to me, that's still your daddy. That's still, it, wouldn't you tell me that, mama? You say that. Well, that's, that's still your daddy. Let that sink a second. Because when God places people in here, it's not because they're perfect. You're not. Why are you expecting everybody else to be? Now, come on. I'm not trying to be mean. It's just the truth. Because if we all want to look a little farther into our lives, we all have something. Right? So you can't choose your family. God chooses your family. So just get happy about it. And won't you try to love that uncle that nobody likes to love? Right? You're birthed into a family. You're birthed into a family. I, I love this. And we see this worked out in Scripture in Acts chapter 4. Uh, there was great persecution coming against the church. And Acts chapter 4, I think, is verse 23 or something like that. And Peter and John, it says, and being let go. This is when they were in prison, right, because of preaching in, G, uh, in, in the name of Jesus and healing and doing these things. And being let go, they went to their what? They went to their own company. And report all the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They went to their what? Their own company. That means there had to be other companies. But they found their own company. So you've got to find your own company. I think it's good. People go and try to find. I mean, I encourage people. Uh, you know, people come to church and they'll say, you know what? I, I like your church, but I just don't know. I say, well, go visit some places. Go find out. Because if you're, if you're here and you're not supposed to be here, then you need to go where you're supposed to be because you're not doing us any good and you're not doing the pastor down the road any good. So you've got to find your own company of people. Now, you're not the one that chooses it. God's the one. You've got to listen to the Spirit. You've got to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. You've got to listen and have that confirmation in your heart. Man, people, say, like I said, they come to this door and say, you know what, this was my, this is my, I knew when I come in the door, this is my church. Right? Something was confirmed in you. Something was speaking to you. You said, well, I, was, I came by an invite. Yeah, it was an invite, but it was a Holy Ghost set up. This is how the church works anyway. You know how the church grows? Let me tell you how the church grows. I mean, listen, Jesus never had to advertise for a meeting, ever. He didn't have to advertise for a meeting. Never did. What he done was, there was stuff that happened and people started talking. You know how the church grows? Because people start talking. Pastor Jim told me that a long time ago. Something I learned from him. He said, listen, if the church stops growing, it's because people aren't talking. And I saw it. You, you stop talking about our church? Come on. I'm not talking about pulling other fish out of other ponds. I'm talking about going and talking to people. About your church? They're going to want to find your church. Because there's a, there's a world full of hurting people. Now, again, we're not the only church. We're not the best church. I believe it's the best church going. Because it's my church. And you ought to feel the same way about your church. Amen. Well, this is, man, this is the best thing on planet Earth. I believe that. Because it's my church. Well, you ought, I, hope, I hope the people up at the Baptist church or the Methodist church or wherever, I hope they're saying the same thing about their church. They ought to be. We're not enemies. We're not enemies. We're all part of the same team. So God, he said, listen, they found their own company of people. See, you were never called to do life alone. You know, God has a pastor for you. Just like a family, right? This is the family of God, right? A family has a father. You know what? God has a pastor for you. God has someone to watch over you. God has, it's, it, it, it's, it's the, it, there's a pastor that is ordained to be a part of your life. That's the truth. In Jeremiah chapter 3, we find this and bore out in 
Jeremiah 3 says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you from one city and, and two from a family, and I will bring you to, to Zion. Zion is the type of the community of the redeemed, the church. He said, I'm going to bring you to the church, and I will give you what? Shepherds, according to my heart, who will feed you with un knowledge and what? Understanding. God wants you to have a shepherd. God wants you to have a pastor. God has a church for you, a family for you. It's people around you. We're building the church. God builds the church with great people. Your pastor is ordained to help you. I'm called to help you and to lead the local church. I have a gift for that. There's a gifting in me for that. Amen. Amen. Man, I would love, listen, you're going through a rough time. Would you call me? Just call me. Don't let me figure it out on Facebook, please. Because I'm not calling you. I'm going to let you know something. If I see it on Facebook, I ain't calling you. Because evidently you didn't want me to know about it. Now, yeah, yeah amen or on me now. Broadcasting, well, didn't you see it on Facebook? Listen, I don't see all my Facebook feed. I have five, six hundred friends. Don't you know I'm well liked? <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm not saying you need to call me with every. But listen, if you're if you're having surgery, would you please please give me a call, please? Would you please give me a call? <laughs> Amen. I would like to know. And please don't let me find out on Facebook. I want to know. There's a gifting in my life. There's something that needs turned in me. And it doesn't turn unless somebody pulls on it. Amen. I'm talking about God has a place for you. I know this is simple teaching. But I want you to realize it. You're not here by happenstance. You're here because God called you. And if you're a visitor here this morning, I want you to understand. Find the place that God's called you to be. Those that are listening on Facebook Live, find you a local church. I'm thankful that we can broadcast across the airwaves. But listen, it's never to be a substitute for you not being a part of a local assembly. Get a part of a local church. Because you were never called to do it alone. If that was truth, Peter and John would have never went to their own company. They would have never went there. If you read on it, so they prayed together. They started praying. And it said, man, they began to prophesy and encourage one another and pray. And it says the very place of the foundation was shook because of their prayer. Why? Because they got into their own company. They got into an assembly of people. And the presence of God is released in the greatest measure in the church. In the body of Christ. God's got a pastor for you. You can't choose your family. So that person that you're setting aside, you may not like them too well. But get used to it. Maybe you're called to help them. Man. We're a family. Say, we are a family, are we not? We're family. We're family. Amen. They were family. See, God has designed the church to be relational. Listen to this now. This is what the Bible says. You've heard me say this before. Proverbs 14, 4 says, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. Listen to this. This is what the Living Bible says. An empty stable stays clean, but there is no income from an empty stable. You know, you, what's it saying? When people come into the church, they bring their stuff with them. So listen, when Nadine's cleaning the floor, she's having to sweep up all the stuff that you left behind. Because when there's a crib, listen, the Bible says when the crib is, is empty, there's no income, there's no increase, there's nothing happening. But when people come that are imperfect and all of a sudden God starts to use those imperfect people and starts building the church. He builds his church with people. And when you got people, you got poop. <laughs> Sorry. But that's the truth. So what happens is people come in, they have messes, stuff starts happening. Listen, this place is up. We got people getting born again, babies. Why do we expect babies to be acting like you? It's been saved 20 years. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to fumble. They're going to fall. You're going to fumble and you're going to fall. I need somebody around me that's going to pick me up. I don't need people around me looking at me. 
I've used this illustration so many times. You're never, listen, when people are hurting, it's never to look at them. You are to turn your backs to them and let them heal as you protect them. You start surrounding them. The pastor gets in here and starts helping him. Group leaders start getting here and starts helping him. See, what you're doing, you're just protecting. You're not sitting there talking bad about him. You're not here talking about, well, did you hear what happened to so and so? Boy, I tell you what, that's awful, isn't it? You know what, I just don't know. I didn't know they, no, they would, probably wouldn't make it. You know what? And all of a sudden, no, what we need to do, we need to produce this wall that people can heal. That people can heal. Because one of these days, you're probably going to be the one that's right there. Where there's no oxen, the crib's clean. But if we want to build something significant, it's going to be some dirt. There's going to be some stuff. And we, we can't be afraid of that. I'm just having a heart-to-heart conversation with you guys. Though. Pastor, do you? I just want you to understand that you're called to a church. And it takes people. He said, I'm going to build my church. How's he going to build it? He's going to build with people. People that are relational. That's why we want you to be a part of a journey group. That meeting once a month in the home is huge. And the devil is getting us so busy with our lives that we're not, that we're not hooking in relationally. This is where true growth happens. It's when I'm connected to you. We've made church about a Sunday morning. When church is about all of us, all the time. Hooking in, sharing life together. I'll talk more about that on Wednesday night. Talking about discipleship. Amen. Amen. Acts 2.42 on the screen. Acts 2.42. And they, this is after the day of Pentecost, outpoured spirit, man. Praise God. God got on the inside of somebody. Always wanted to be that way. And it says they continued steadfastly in the what? The apostles' doctrine. Fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. Stay right there a second. They continued steadfastly in the what? Apostles' teaching. Well, if you wanted to hear the apostles' teaching... You had to go where the apostles were at. If you don't watch out, your phones will become your worship leader. Your iPad will become your preacher. Because we are in a a digital, and I love love it, man. I love technology. But I'm telling you something. It takes one click to turn some Bethel music on. It takes one click to turn an iPad on. Uh, you know, someone to be preaching off of a podcast. One click. Or on YouTube. One click. And if you don't watch out, that will substitute for you. There's people that do it all the time. They make decisions to stay home. They make, well, I can just catch it online. I get it. I understand it. If you're sick, I understand. Stay home, please. But I'm telling you, listen, it's never to be the substitute from gathering in the local assembly. People, we need each other. It's you, you're here. I'm not preaching at you. I promise you. I'm just saying we have to make sure, hey, listen, we push to get here because why? There's something that's going on inside the body of Christ, inside this local church that you need. People say, well, I, I wasn't going to, people said this to me, to, to me before. Well, I wasn't going to come today, but I'm glad I did. I pushed myself. Man, you start pushing yourself. You start becoming a part. I'll talk about that next week a little more about that ladder that was extended from heaven earth but I want you to realize it's relational don't ever let this something else substitute for the local church I'm not saying you can't be saved that's, that's wrong, you can be saved, go to heaven never go to church but listen, it's not, it's not one, I'm talking about you and I becoming a force you and I becoming a part of something bigger than you you understand you understand, we sit, just right here in this church, we sit on 23 acres. We have this building. That's, we're, this place is valued well over $1.5 million. You know what? We're completely debt-free. You 
became a part of something that was bigger than you. And you, and that when you gave, you tithe, you gave your offerings in this place, and we was able to pay this building off, we don't, we don't spend 45 minutes taking up an offering. If that's what it takes, I'm going back to nursing. I'm being serious. I'm not doing that. We come up here and exhort five, ten minutes about an offering, and you guys just do what God tells you to do because you understand it. Become a part of something bigger than you. And we get to enjoy, get to, un- get, to, get to enjoy this great place, this local church in this building because of people. Again, this is not about the building in itself. It's about us as people. But we do assemble here in this church here. Amen. Are you guys all right? So church is not a perfect, perfect place. All right? It's a place of grace. It's a place of do-overs. It's a place of growth and change. It's a place kids mess up. People make bad decisions, bad choices. People fall down. But it's a place that people get back up. Amen? Praise God. Are you with me here? Strong churches are built with strong people. Strong, listen to this now. Strong, strong churches produce strong families. Strong families produce strong communities. Strong communities change the world. Amen. So it takes people. The final thing is this, it's the presence of God. The presence of God. If you notice Jacob, when he woke up, up, he said, you know what, surely this is, surely the presence of the Lord is here, and I didn't even know it. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Again, the primal idea of church. See, church is a place that the presence of God should be encountered. It's a place that the presence of God It says, surely this is the house of God. Surely this is the gate of heaven. Gate is a gate of influence. The word gate in the Bible means influence. A gate takes people from one place or allows people to go from one place into another. When that gate opens, it takes you from here to there. It takes you from here to there. See, when people come into the church, they they ought to encounter the presence of God. They ought to encounter God's presence. Now, you and I have a lot to do with that. I want to encourage you to come here, man, ready to release the presence of God in you. I want you to come and engage. I want you to come and be ready. I want you to produce, I want us as a, as a church to, 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 uh, to, 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 to create an atmosphere for rain. To create an atmosphere for God to move in. There are some places God can't move in. He can't. I'm not saying God's presence is real fickle. I'm just saying this. When you and I are coming in and engaging and making sure we're creating an atmosphere, people's lives will be changed, and they want to be a part of that. If we want this church to grow, it takes people and it takes the presence of God. Who are we without the presence of the Lord? We're nothing. We're we're a social club. We come in here and heard some guy talk for 45 minutes about something and, and give you some information. We've sung some songs off of the board. Right? But without the presence of God, we have nothing. We're no different than the, than, than, than the Moose Club or whatever. No different. Amen. What makes us different is the presence of the Lord. So, well, Pastor, how do we create an atmosphere? Let me give you just two quick things, real quick. How do I create an atmosphere for the presence of God? Number one, love. Love. God is love. So he's going to be found in an atmosphere of love. And the second thing is unity. I want to encourage us all in this room. If you hear anything, hear me, hear me say this. You and I have to protect unity at all costs. Psalm 133 says, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands the blessing." I want you to understand, unity is the most powerful thing we have as as, as a body. Think about this. How how am I going to push a thousand pound rock? I'm not going to be able to push it. But if we all get in unity, we will. 
the enemy comes, the, the first thing he'll try to do is try to sow discord. He tries to come in and cause division because he understands if I can divide this thing, then the power leaves. So you protect unity at all costs, church. You make sure. You, I, I, can't, I can't be everywhere where you're at. Someone starts to come talk to you about somebody, want to talk, want to call you on the phone, shut it down. Amen. Shut it down. No, 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 we're not going there because why? Unity is very important to us. You say, man, I want the presence of God. I do too. You know why the presence of the Lord is? I've had people, oodles of people. I can't tell you how many people I've called on the phone. I call visitors and say, thank you for coming. And you know, man, I, man I, I felt something there. I've not felt that. I had somebody tell me this. He said, listen, I've been searching for this for 20 years. I felt something there that I haven't felt in a long time. Now, not that we're walking by feeling, but I'm telling you what, it's good to feel something. How about it? I want, to, I want that to feel something every now and then. And sometimes I need to feel that. Not that, I'm, not that I'm, again, not that I'm building on feelings, but I'm telling you something, the presence of the Lord will change you. It will, all of a sudden, God's presence starts to come. And next thing you know, you start hearing stuff from God about your life. And things start changing. And things start moving. And all of a sudden, that burden you was carrying was just demolished because of the presence of the Lord, right? For the anointing, it breaks the yoke. The presence of God breaks the yoke. The, the greatest tool that you and I have as believers is the corporate anointing. Because why? You come and bring your river. You come and bring your river. You come and bring your river. And you come bring your river. And all of a sudden we start releasing rivers in this place. That's why, man, we, why, do, why do we go and put words up on the screen? Because we want you to sing in unison. In unity. Right? And you start declaring, decreeing. We start, man, hooking in with our heart. And I felt it this morning. I felt this morning we were declaring, man, who he was and, and what a beautiful name it is, right? And we started saying, you know, there is no rival. There's, our hearts were connected into that. I, we were in unity, man. I felt the presence of God. All of a sudden, someone in the back row gets touched. Right? Next thing you know, man, God spoke to you and gave you the answer that you need. Where would it happen at? Right in a corporate anointing. Not that God can't speak through a... Through a, uh, through a camera. But maybe you wouldn't get it there. there was, I will say this. I'll say this uh, very, uh, I guess I'll say this very boldly. There are some things that's reserved for the corporate setting that you will not get anywhere else. I believe that. Uh, that's my personal opinion, but I believe that. Because there the Lord commands the blessing. Man, you got that? How does God build a tree? He won't build it on the foundation of Jesus. Yes, but how's he going to build it? He's going to build it with people. He's going to build it with what? The presence of the Lord. Those two things. Amen? Praise God. You guys get anything out of that? Amen. I just want you to stay intentional. Okay? Stay intentional. Stay intentional. Don't lose your intention. I want to play something back there. You know... I think about unity. I want you to understand something as we close. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not being the same. The way the, Bi the Bible talks about unity, and it talks about unity in this, it's unity within diversity. It's kind of like an engine. Inside of that, or your body. Inside of that thing, you've got this... Pistons running, you got stuff going on in that in that in that engine, you got the pistons going, you got this part doing this part, and this part doing that part, and this part part, but it's all working as one. Unity is not uniformity. It's not being the same. It's unity within diversity. It's because we have one mind, one heart, one purpose. What's our purpose when we come in this church? Is to lift Jesus high. My purpose when I come into this church is to, is, to, is to love someone. Right? Seek the highest good of another person. And we, we've become.
become so consumerized in our call. It's consumerized, is that right? It's a word now. It's about what you can give me. Well, I come to church because I need my, I need my fix. I need my fix. It's me. It's about me. It's really not about you. It's about somebody else. And when I find out it's not about me, guess what happens? When I start making it about somebody else, you know what starts to happen? I find my need getting met. Automatically. Why? Because I got it off of me. Amen. You guys are all right. People in presence. Praise God. Thank you for letting me just be honest with you today. Talk to you as a pastor. I love talking about the church. It's powerful. Father, we thank you this morning for the church. I thank you for the universal church. I thank you, Lord God, for the body of Christ that's across this whole world. Today, God, in Haiti, people, Lord God, are worshiping you. In the mountains of Haiti, in the plains of Haiti, in the cities, Lord God, they're worshiping you. Today, Lord God, in Africa, they're worshiping you. There's churches that are meeting, assembling together. Assembling together to lift you up on high. And Lord, we're a part of that. We're a part of that. We're a part of it. And Lord, I pray that all of us in this room would just recapture the, the heart. And recapture, Lord, and refire our desire for the local church. We have a great church here, Lord. I thank you for every person. But God, let us sure things up. Let us... Let us, let us sure some things up. Let us, let us come in and reinforce some things. And let us, God, I pray during this whole series that we would be understanding again of the power and the purpose of the local church. And Lord, the people in this room, God, that are new here, maybe they're visitors or those, God, that are here and been visiting for a bit, I pray, God, that they would, Lord God, I pray they'll find this place home. I pray they'll find here home. I pray, God, that this will be the place that you, this certain place that they happen to light upon, the certain place that they came to, and God, they'll let you lay their head upon, uh, you lay their head upon them and give them the vision, the dream, God, that you've placed for this church in them. And they can begin to be a part and be a stone in this thing and begin to build this church, God, the church, this local church that you have called and ordained to be here for such a time as this. So I'm asking, God, that we would all find it refreshing, refiring, refueling. But God will also, those that are in this room that never made a commitment, will say, yes, that's my church. And they'll put their hand to the plow. And they'll begin to build and help. So I thank you for it. I bless these folks today. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eyes closed.